I decided that as, as I was sitting here working on a presentation on the four humors and the great chain of being, that this was a good opportunity for me to provide you some additional information. So in class, where I'm going to mention the four humors, again, I mentioned it in the previous podcast, but the idea that in Greek, medieval, and Renaissance thought, Greek, medieval, and Renaissance thought, the traditional four elements form the basis for a theory of medicine and later psychological typology, psychological organization, that there are groups of people that think a certain way, and so we group them together similarly, that they were grouped based upon the balance of the four humors in the body. Humor is spelled the French way, H-U-M-O-U-R-S. These four humors, these fluids, can constituted the Western equivalent of the Chinese five states of change. Each of the humors were associated with various correspondences and particular physical and mental characteristics and could, moreover, be combined for more complex personality types. So you may not be necessarily one type, but you might be a blend. So when we go through and we talk about the development of these four humors, this is something I think is significant. Uh, again, I'm, I'm trained in Latin, and I do a tremendous amount of reading. And when I talk in class about colors, like passions, like the red, turn red in the face, Chaucer does the exact same thing in the Canterbury Tales. He takes character traits, I believe it's the monk, is red in the face. Well, that kind of goes along with sort of the idea that he has too much passion or too much of a certain thing. And this allows us at least an opportunity to talk about the sort of intellectual organization of information in this text. So the four humors. Those four humors are specifically defined as sanguine. S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. A sanguine humor. We know that if you're sanguinous, it means you're filled with blood. Sanguine, uh, it's a term that comes along with blood. I believe it comes from the Latin. We have phlegmatic. Phlegmatic is P-H-L-E-G-M-A-T-I-C. Phlegmatic. Then we have melancholy, or a melancholic humor. We know what melancholy is. It's an overriding sense of ennui, an overriding sense of sadness. The fourth humor is that of choleric, C-H-O-L-E-R-I-C. Now, along with these four humors, they are defined specific ways. So this, to me, also becomes very interesting because our characters are going to be defined by these characteristics. For example, if you're choleric, you're often described as hot. If you're, if you're melancholy, you're often cold. So there's certain characteristics that go along even with these particular bits of information. So again, in Greek, medieval, and Renaissance thought, the, the traditional four elements form the basis for a theory of medicine and later psychological typology, psychological organization. In classic thought, in classic intellectual thought, Medicine was equated with philosophy and the three Greek philosophers like Hippocrates, and they spent a lot of their time examining the balance of these humors in the body and what that effect was going to be. We see it in Arabic culture. We see it in Roman culture. This becomes a huge concept. So again, your four humors. So if I look sort of at what the effect of these humors are, for example, if you are sanguine, that humor is most represented by the the that humor is most represented by blood. So the old idea of medicine with leeches that they would use to suck the blood out of the body, this was an attempt to quite simply balance the blood by taking blood out of the body. Uh, this humor, the sanguine humor, was produced by the liver. And how do we see that humor represented in our characters? Well, typically, the characters were red-cheeked, passionate, whether you're blushing. Uh, they were often corpulent, which is a fancy way of saying fat. 
and chubby. Now, it seems to be a pretty easy thing that if you're filled with passion, it doesn't mean that you have heart disease. It means that you are driven by something specific. So the character traits that go along with a sanguine individual, along with being red-cheeked and fat and those kinds of characteristics, hot, because, you know, being filled with blood makes you warm. What do we see as characteristics of a sanguine personality? Well, we talk about being amorous, full of love, passionate characters that want to run off and catch the girl and, and whisk her away and say, oh, to hell with the consequences. Happy characters, they're generous, they're optimistic. Uh, they're oftentimes irresponsible. We're brave. We don't care about the consequences. We care instead about having the fun, enjoying ourselves, etc., etc. A melancholy character, for example, uh, that humor is represented by a black bile, that produced by our gallbladder. Uh, bile's not, it's sort of a vestigial fluid now, but the black bile, if you had too much of that, uh, that element is represented by the earth. So a character really uh, melancholy in their presentation is going to be somebody who's really close to the earth. Whether they work with it, whether they work with their hands, whatever those might be. This character is going to be cold, is going to be dry, might have flaky skin, uh, might have dry hands. We make some specific references to those ideas. We also know that they're going to be thin. They're going to be drawn. They're going to be almost to the point of being sickly, they're so thin. So this is another characteristic that we see as significant in Chaucer's presentation because he knows this, because his audience is going to know these things as he does the reading. They're going to be able to recognize these characteristics. A melancholy person is going to be introspective, is going to be sentimental, is going to really care about feelings to say, how do I feel about this? Well, I'm going to brood. I'm going to be silent. I'm not going to say a whole lot because I'm going to instead sit and think about what all this is going to be. A third characteristic of the melancholy person is they're going to be gluttonous. Now, the idea of gluttony and the idea of some of these uh, physical manifestations of these characteristics ties into the idea that these were designed to meet up with the seven deadly sins. The church intended some of these humors to say, okay, if you have a balance, you're going to be more given towards a specific deadly sin. So with melancholy, it's going to be gluttony. With uh, a sanguine personality, it's going to be a passion. It could be lust, something like this. Now, the reason the church did this is because what it does is it allows them to then attach characteristics to those types of humors, those types of behaviors. And therefore, if you can attach humors to them, you can come up with a specific way to deal with each of these sort of attributes. So if you're too passionate, you can be given, I don't know, some sort of cure, some sort of, uh, some sort of punishment, maybe, if you will, so that you don't get yourselves too worked up, you don't get too concerned. This reminds me of what we talked about in the sophomore year with Kate Chopin and the idea of the rest cure where in 19th century American literature, especially this emergent feminine voice pers personality, this, this area, that if a woman became too concerned about her own passions and her own needs, and she found herself being too driven by those passions, which in men we never said was a bad thing, which even in the Middle Ages we don't see as a bad thing. But if these women were driven too much by their passions in American 19th century literature, this guy, S. Weir Mitchell, came up with his rest cure. That women were fed steady diets of fatty, slowly digested foods and basically punished to, to be locked in a room without movement, without intellectual stimulation. So you're locked in a bedroom. You're not given books. You're not certainly given TV. You're not given the opportunity to write or express yourself. And the idea here is that you get this rest cure long enough and you're not going to uh, have passion. That's going to kind of be broken in you so that we no longer fight against the system. So it becomes an element of social control. So I think, again, there's a lot going on here that is of great value to us as a, as a study of literature. 
So I gave you sanguine and I gave you melancholic. Choleric is represented by yellow bile produced by the spleen. The element that represents choleric behavior is fire. So your characters are going to be hot. They're going to be dry. Again, very similar to what a melancholic character is, but the melancholic is going to be cold. How, what are we going to see is, is examples of the choleric character. They're going to be red-haired. Uh, they're going to be thin. Kind of an interesting idea here, not to disparage anybody, but when you look at stereotypes that are cast on the groups of people, I'm going to use the Irish here, I'm enough Irish that I'm sort of looking at myself, that if you're choleric, you're red-haired, you're thin, and the character traits that go along with this is violence, you're vengeful, you're short-tempered, you got that fiery Irish temper, Got it in my family. I'm very much aware of that. But on a positive note, I guess, is that if you're choleric, you're also ambitious. Now that ambition can be good and bad. The fourth major humor here was that of, of phlegmatic. That if you're phlegmatic, uh, for example, the humor is phlegm, P-H-L-E-G-M. Uh, your character is cold and moist. Oftentimes, a corpulent character or, again, a chubby, fat character it might be phlegmatic. And what do you see as characteristics? Uh, sluggish, uh, pallid, cowardly. So you look at your characteristics. So these four humors are extraordinarily important in explaining medieval thought and the organization of the universe. Now... I have this information on Moodle. I have an excellent diagram for us to look at. At this moment, I've taken that diagram down. Uh, there is on here sort of a modern explanation based upon uh, Rudolf Steiner, who derived a lot of his ideas from uh, Greco medieval thought. Uh, not unsurprisingly, incorporated the humors into his overall synthesis. Here's his lecture on the four temperaments. So even modern psychologists have said this stuff's really important and we want to pay attention to it. I have that information in class. We might go over it. We might not. But I think in the grand scheme of things, I'm looking for the timer. Uh, this is a good segment of information. Now, I'm going to make these available on Moodle. I like doing this thing with the light because if I move in, I get brighter. If I move out, I don't. Ha! Ah, you know, I get to sit here in my office and do this. So you have the opportunity to kind of flesh out your notes. There's a lot of density here. These notes are going to be due for me probably by Friday so that you have the opportunity to go through and listen to them. I will quiz you on this material. I do talk fast, so it does give you an opportunity when you put it on YouTube to stop it, pause it, kind of move around, etc., etc. So you have access to the information. It would also be a benefit to you to meet up with your peers, to make sure you have the information, to make sure you understand what's going on. Seems to make sense. So this adds a little level of texture that I think is of value. Make sure you listen. Make sure you pay attention. I'm at 13 minutes and 22 seconds. I'm going to end this particular podcast so that you have the information. Of course, you can look all this up and not listen to how I explain it. It's up to you. So with that, have a terrific rest of your day. I'm going to turn this coffee cup around so you can see it. In case I ask you for a bonus question about Oakland University, my wife did her graduate work here. I have an Aquinas College Cup, but I left that at U of D. So with that, you have a good rest of your evening.